The Bank of England policy decision just out now and, as expected, they've kept uh, quantitative easing, the bond buying programme, on hold at £375 billion and interest rates also on hold at half of 1%. And this time, uh, with no policy move, they have not put out a statement either, unlike last month, of course. So for his reaction, let's get out now to James Knightley, senior economist at ING. Well, James, um, thankfully no statement this time. <laughs> it's a blindside us again. So on hold, everything points towards the inflation report next week. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're just six days away from when we actually get this formal announcement on the Bank of, Assist Bank of England's assessment on the work merits of forward guidance and intermediate thresholds. So there, there didn't really seem a great deal of point in, in putting out a statement. And indeed, you know, the effectiveness of last month's, uh, last month's statement it was still there. I mean, uh, gilt yields have been capped, uh, sterling has been capped to the upside as well, and, and interest rate expectations have been pushed back well into 2015. There's a slight reaction in the market, uh, sterling picking up about uh, 40, 50 ticks uh, back above 152. So there's obviously some expectation or a slight expectation that they may have come out with a statement on forward guidance. Yeah, there was, there was certainly that possibility, and I guess, as you said, you know, that we were somewhat blindsided by last month's announcement, so there was always that risk, and, you know, if they'd come out and sort of reaffirmed it, then that perhaps would have, would have justified Sterling perhaps being a little bit weaker as we head into this forward guidance anticipation next week. Carney, um, bizarrely as it may sound, he may be in something of an uncomfortable position, um, but not because of weak data, but because of strong data. Uh, today's PMIs, for example, extremely strong pointing to annual growth, annualised growth for around 4%, yet he's already told us about this forward guidance. How does he manage that one? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a nice position to, to be in, to be honest, uh, especially when you compare it to the start of the year when we were actually quite gloomy about the prospects of the UK economy. It's been quite a rapid turnaround. But um, I guess, you know, we're, we're not all financial journalists, we're not all economists. Um, you know, householders are still somewhat cautious on, on the outlook. And I think providing a bit of forward guidance actually helps them. Um, if they can state, for example, that Bank of England interest rates, interest rates aren't going to rise for the next 12 months, that will perhaps give households a bit more confidence to go out and borrow. And also those hard-pressed savers, which have been waiting for interest rates to rise, well, they may actually finally throw in the towel and may actually do something else with their money. They may look to invest in the stock market or, or corporate bonds or, or actually spend it, which again would all help to, mm -hmm. to stimulate the economy. So just to be clear, you think that uh, today's data and the other pieces of data we've had, the strong data notwithstanding, the bank will still press on with forward guidance next week? Yeah, I think that's right. I don't, certainly not QE, certainly no more rate uh, cuts, but I think they want to keep the monetary conditions that are currently pretty accommodative in place to ensure that recovery continues. They don't want the market to push on and, and push up sterling and, and push up interest rates and push up gilt yields, which could threaten to constrain growth and actually derail those, those somewhat nascent recovery signs that we're starting to see. So no more QE, no more bond buying, no more rate cuts. What might else uh, they go ahead with? Buying, buying other sorts of assets? I, to be honest, I don't think they, they need to. I think um, there's enough signs now that the recovery is gaining a bit of momentum. There's also been positive signs from external economies such as the Eurozone. The data flow is looking a little bit better there. The US outlook for the second half of this year is probably better than the first half. So I don't think they need to do anything else. It's more about keeping those, that, the current market conditions in place to ensure that that recovery can continue. And just to finish up, as I mentioned earlier, uh, today's PMI, manufacturing PMI, consistent with annualised growth of around 4%, pretty punchy. That's got to be unsustainable, right? We would assume so. I mean, we'd assume something of it tailing off um, a little bit. But, you know, the near-term outlook is still there. We've still got a lot of growth loss that's got to be made up. So there is still spare capacity in the economy. So a bit of a tra above trend growth would actually be quite a welcome, welcome environment to be in right now. Indeed. James, thank you very much. That was James Knightley at ING. Now, although it's been an upbeat day for European stocks today, led by financials, some stocks are taking a battering. Shell's shares are down almost 5% after rising costs and problems in Nigeria hurt profits. ArcelorMittal, the world's biggest steelmaker, down 2.5%. It's underperforming the stock's 600 basic resources index after cutting its profit outlook. Same story for French drug maker Sanofi. It cut its 2013 guidance as patent losses eat into profits. Join me again at this time every weekday when we'll be taking the pulse of the market for you. But that's all for today. I'm Jamie McGeever. This is Reuters.
Hello? Sorry. Hi. That's all right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know the, the, the lead indicators that we've been seeing so far are, are encouraging. The ADP payrolls number yesterday was 200,000 after 198,000 the previous month. So that's historically been the single best lead indicator for, for employment growth. Consumer confidence is still pretty strong as well. So that suggests that households are increasingly relaxed about their job prospects and, and, and therefore more inclined to spend. So I think that is a positive sign. And, and so, as I say, we're looking for a quite a decent payroll, but probably around the 200,000 mark tomorrow. Yeah, I think the Fed didn't want to pre-commit um, yesterday, and they had to acknowledge that some of the recent GDP numbers haven't been as good as perhaps we've been hoping for. Um, so, you know, in, toward, in order to get this taper, I think it is the employment numbers, but also they would like to see growth in general um, accelerate uh, from where we currently are. So the risks we would suggest are that it taper probably doesn't come until a little bit later. We'd suggest something like the December meeting, or possibly even into next year. I think we've still got a lot of concern about the fiscal debate going on in the US and the debt ceiling story is yet to, to return um, and is going to return with quite a, quite a vengeance uh, later this year. And of course, the Fed is going to be wary that what happened in 2011 when we hit this sort of environment did derail growth to some extent. It did hurt sentiment. It did hurt activity. So for choice, I, I would think that the Fed will want to be fairly cautious and want to see that this, this uh, debt debate and debt ceiling debates actually moves on uh, in a conducive manner before they would want to taper. Um, well, I think if we get a, a good momentum heading into the third and fourth quarters, then that would obviously make them a little bit more relaxed. But we just don't know how this debate on, on, the, on the fiscal matters is really going to materialise. So yet, you know, we could get some good employment numbers, but if, uh, if uh, the fiscal discussions get uh, bogged down somewhat, then that could yet lead, a, lead to a delay in the taper. Pleasure. And you. See you later.